everybody. How y'all doing? Hey. Good. So a lot has happened this week, especially with Bubba Wallace and especially with the noose that was hanging in his garage. NASCAR did an exhaustive investigation. They said in, I don't know, almost 1,700 garages and all the tracks that they've been at, they've only found one noose. And that one noose was in Bubba's garage. So I think, Simone, you were on the call today with Bubba. How did that go and what was it like? He was cool. I mean, he was pissed. But, I mean, you know, he's got everything, not only racing, but off the track stuff. And then he's got to worry. Well, you're obviously not worried about it, but he's got the whole thing surrounding people calling him a hoax. And um, the NASCAR president, he was on a call yesterday and he was not having like the theories of people calling Bubba Wallace a hoax. Like he kept reiterating the fact that this has Bubba didn't even find the news. If anyone who, like the fact that people are calling Bubba a, like a liar or a fraud is like the most offensive thing about this whole situation. And, you know, a lot of people were coming at him for saying, when they immediately found the news for saying that it was a hate crime off the bat. And he was pretty much pissed about that. Like he was like, why are people mad? Um, if your first reaction to seeing a noose isn't, if your mind doesn't automatically go to, it's a hate crime, then you need to reevaluate the history of what a noose means and everything. And he's like, he doesn't know why NASCAR himself is being criticized for automatically assuming that it was a hate crime. And even if the noose was in the stall in 2019, the noose was still in the stall. Like that's still, even if it wasn't because Bubba was there now, the fact that it was ever there period just speaks to the culture that NASCAR has let go on for so long. And they've got a lot of cleaning up to do. And I was talking to Sam yesterday, um, Y'all know Sam Crenshaw. I was talking to him yesterday, and he was saying, um, yeah, the noose was in there in 2019, but out of all the drivers and out of all the times, what's the coincidence that Bubba was in that stall? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And like you said, NASCAR's got 50 years of – of of harboring and making the safe haven for uh southern racists mm -hmm. and the confederate flag and all that stuff like even across the street from talladega they still had the confederate flags flying and they still had um and they still had the uh there's a plane that flew that's read defund nascar yeah. like what is that all about so he about that too, he was saying how you know the protesting NASCAR people. He was like, "You'll never see the police out there, you know, spraying them with rubber bullets or tear gassing them like they do the peaceful protesters in Atlanta. Like they're gonna let them spew all their hate and carry on about their business." Mm hmm. So Bubba's gonna race at the Poconos this weekend. Um, when you're watching this and, uh, you know, NASCAR's done a good job up to this point as far as, you know, trying to be on the right side and trying to clean up all these different things because, like I say, like they still have a ways to go, but the steps they've taken so far, Macy and Anthony, I feel like they've done a really good job. What do y'all say? Of course. Um... NASCAR has definitely shown that they are trying to change the culture that has definitely hindered them in the past. And um, kind of what Simone said about Bubba, Bubba and everybody criticizing him and NASCAR for the hopes and um, basically, basically, I guess, jumping, jumping ahead saying this is a hate crime. It's like you know, what What else are people supposed to think? Like, how else are we supposed to react to the situation? Like, we're all African-American men and women here in the Zoom call. So we definitely understand how it would feel, basically, if we walk 
because this is his workplace. If we walked into our workplace at our desk and we see a noose hanging right there at our desk and we're, the, you know, it just happened to be at our desk. Like, what, what else would, would we be able to assume? Uh, but I definitely think NASCAR is heading in the uh, right direction. Um, I'm just... I'm just glad that I can, I'm able to see that change and seeing they'll be able to act upon it. And hopefully this situation, anything similar never happens again. Um, and that, that gets, continues to grow as a brand because personally I've seen a lot of, um, just for me, from my experience, I've seen a lot of African-American black people Wanted to watch NASCAR now, of course, because we're in the pandemic and it's not that many sports, but they're gaining some fans. And uh, I'm pretty sure they're gaining fans not only from the black community, they probably gain it from the other communities as well because of the stand they're taking. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's great the work that NASCAR is Technology, what can you do? What can you do? <laughs> I think Macy is about to jump back in. Fierce. Okay, I don't know if this is better. <laughs> Much better. <laughs> oh, man. I was like, I could hear y'all. I just couldn't, couldn't weigh in. I guess I was from <laughs> <laughs> but um i was just saying like i'm happy that nascar um made an effort a conscious effort to um take the blame away from bubba and they seen where it was going with the new cycle how it was painting him as the juicy smollett of nascar and um they made a point like hey let me drop this picture on you because all of these other distant videos and pictures were coming out and I even had people comment on my post like oh that's not a noose and I'm like um bruh that's a noose and I think almost every black person knows precisely what the, what a noose looks like um also I watched a couple of like ESPN sports uh shows talk shows and there are definitely people that are out there saying that the media hasn't done their job as far as um, researching what is in the other stalls and people are putting up videos from old YouTubes like, oh, see, here's a rope. Not a big deal. Not an issue. And I'm like, OK, yes, everyone knows what a garage pool looks like and how it can be a rope. Um, but that one specifically in the way it was tied was a noose. And it's just unfortunate that it took place, but I'm happy that um, we have the proper people speaking out and going through the right channels to, you know, um, clean up the mess. Absolutely. So we're going to move right along. There's a new segment on our show and it's titled the triangle offense basically three topics we discuss three topics each topic gets 60 seconds each so you know whatever pops up in your mind like let's have it let's roll with it so first and foremost many nba players have gotten tested for corona a lot of players got corona um, and it seems as though the NBA is doing all this testing before the teams and the players can arrive in the Orlando bubble. Compare that to the NFL. Do you think the NBA is taking the right approach to this or not? I mean, I feel like the NFL is behind the curve on everything. So, it's nice that they are trying to protect some of the players um, before they get into an exclusive little area. But, um, I mean, at this point, it's, everything is like a, a practice test. Everything is like a, a placebo and variables. We don't know what can happen or what will happen, but it's nice they're taking the initiative. 
Yeah, I agree. I feel like it's nice that they're taking the initiative and it seems like they're willing to adjust and make, well, they've been saying like, you know, with new information, stuff may change, nothing's permanent, but I feel like the NFL is way, like, I feel like they're not even recognizing the fact that how are you, do y'all realize how many people y'all have for one team off the whole offense, defense, now y'all got to have a whole slew of backups because if one dude tests positive, I guess they say they just bring out next, next guy up. They got all the training staff, physical therapy, all those coaches. Do they even really need all those coaches and all those coordinator, all those staff? They got a whole lot of people that's going to be, you know, passing the virus around. So I really don't get how football – can work and then like baseball like just came out and put their little plan out and it's just too much throwing out the balls every time a couple of people really it's not that serious y'all need to be playing like baseball already boring to watch if you're not there and if we're not gonna be there and y'all doing the most like it's a lot y'all not see how crazy this sounds like um yeah i mean I guess if you're going to play, yes, this this is the right approach. You definitely want to test everybody and make sure, you know, see if, who has the coronavirus, if not, um, have regular testing, have the necessary medical personnel and whatnot. Um, but honestly, kind of to what Simone was alluding to, I mean – I hate to say it, but we kind of might need to hold off on sports for a minute just because um, we don't know what's going on with the coronavirus right now. Like, it's it's still spreading. We're still in the pandemic. Um, we, don't, we don't want anybody else catching it or worse, the loss of life. Like, mm-hmm. One of the things that uh, the English Premier League – uh, they start. They restarted their campaign a couple of. I think last week. Last week. Last week. Yeah, last week. They started their. Restarted their campaign last week. But the thing about the United Kingdom was they went into strict lockdown. Like you could only. The only time you went outside was to step in your front yard or your backyard. You could not do anything else. So like, but their culture was that they're used to war and being bombed and the whole Protestant versus Catholic conflict over there. So telling those folks to stay inside was like a piece of cake. Whereas here in America, it's like, "Mm -mm, no, mm -mm, no, no, uh uh-uh. You mess with our freedom, all that stuff, like, nah. So to your point, Anthony, I feel like, you know, with the new outbreaks in Texas and Florida and California, like at this point, we, those states must go back to mitigation mode. And then like, we can revisit the idea of playing sports and all those different things, because that brings me to my second point or the second topic in our triangle offense, the NFLPA has spoken out against group workouts as a way to mitigate the spread of coronavirus among players. Malcolm Jenkins said on CNN the other day that the NFL is a non-essential business. Right, that's what he said. Um, Do y'all believe that the NFL can actually slow the spread of COVID-19 during training camp? No. I mean, they don't even have a plan. (laughs) Like, Personally, it doesn't look like they have a conclusive plan. So I'm going to just simply say no. Um, No. Um, And the reason I say this is because, interesting point, I don't know if they're moving training camp, but do you guys know where the Falcons practice and train at? Mm -hmm. And you know which county Flowery Branch is in? Hall County. And isn't that the county that has, has become a hot spot or was a hot spot for the coronavirus? Yeah. I think you guys get kind of what I'm alluding to. Like, yeah. depending on the place where you're at, like, it is definitely hard and difficult, especially when you're in a place 
not even it doesn't even have to be a hall counting a flowery branch. But when you're in a different place, like it's just too much going on at once, too many people moving, too many people working around. It's it's too complicated, it's too hard. So I would say I agree. I just think you can't, you can't control those dudes. Like they've already <laughs> told us they go do what they want. They gonna go to the club. They go go to somebody's house. They all gonna be chilling. They the virus is going to be present. Like unless you shut down quarantine, which we've learned outside of sports or in sports, the virus is going to spread. And you gonna tell me some of those dudes not going to be at the club, not going to be at Boogaloo, not going to be at Magic City. Like, come on, y'all. We already know they're not going to be in quarantine. So it's the inevitable is going to happen. That's true. And lastly, our last little thing in the triangle offense, June 22nd, on June 22nd, Major League Baseball agreed to a 60-game season with expanded playoffs. With so few games and with the season being staged as a sprint to the postseason, what things are you looking forward to the most? Macy, you and I are baseball fans, so what do you yeah. think? Anthony, you Oh, yeah, give it to me. <laughs> Like, hey. <laughs> I really don't even know right now. Let me gather my thoughts while he gets his 60 seconds off. <laughs> <laughs> um, It's a lot, honestly. I'm wondering pretty much how the season is going to shake up. Um, are, are the bats going to be hot? Are we going to see teams play out like they're supposed to be? What about the players who are – who is this is their contract year. Like, they have so little time to prove it, so how would that play out? Um, those are just some of the many questions and things I'm willing to look forward to. Also, we just talked about it with the coronavirus going and how they're going to handle that. Um, basically, how would they tackle balls being in? And also, if I'm not mistaken, the Red Sox, they're thinking about eventually having fans for their games. So will other teams and stadiums adopt the same thing? Wait, you said the Red Sox. Are you meaning Sox, Cincinnati? The Yankees, the Mets, because they're you know, they the are with their reopening. Cincinnati. Like they're those states actually have a decrease in because mm -hmm. they're putting people like they're putting all the outsiders on 14 day quarantine when they travel to New York and Massachusetts. So like I don't know why. I don't know. I'm tripping right now. Anyway. I'm yeah. like, it's the Red Sox, right? Like about the Red Sox. I was confused. I'm like, Sorry. I, think I think that's my rival team. I, I think I think so. <laughs> so um my thing is like, you know, during these long uh, seasons they have like different series and I've always kind of wondered like how a, a baseball season would shake out if it was shorter or more condensed um, but yes like Anthony said it's interesting because you know sometimes you're hot you have the luxury to get hot in a series because you play multiple games but you know and back to back, but you know, if you're not in that kind of incident or situation, it's kind of like, okay, this is like a weekend tourney. How's this gonna do? Like um, travel ball. Um, but I'm excited. I hope that you know the shortening of the season brings a little bit more excitement to the game. Um, but besides that, I mean, you know, just like basketball, it's shorter. That well not necessarily shorter, but there's, you know, a condensed schedule about to take place. So everyone that's in a contract year or, you know, kind of has to show their worth is kind of pressed for time and on all sports. So we're just not to see how it plays out. Yeah, I agree. I feel like the shortened season will definitely could be like a huge benefit for like fans because those long seasons, you get burned out, especially in baseball where you're playing the same team five nights in a row. 
Um, but I don't know how that's going to work with the virus. Cause I, the, what I saw, they said that they're going to be, you know, just playing like their close team. Mm-hmm. So are we just going to be seeing them playing them over and over again. Like, how is that going to work? Cause traveling like Arizona, the hot spot, Florida, hot spot. How does that work for those teams there? And as far as I knew, I thought Boston was in like lockdown, lockdown, like where they're required to wear masks out and everything. So will everybody in the um, stands have to wear a mask at a baseball game and pass out? (laughs) I don't know, but I think it'll be definitely interesting to see. I think baseball is really reaching – really reaching right now because well baseball you kind of can social distance in baseball like you know in the outfield and all that it is i feel like it is one of the lower risk sports so i i fully agree there were some folks there were some folks who um who were just saying like you know we can you know I'll wear a mask. I'll wear a face visor if i have to in order to watch my yankees play like, i don't care just put my braids back on TV. I don't care. Like, and <laughs> I'm just like, Hey, whatever, whatever works, whatever works for y'all works for me. I, I just want sports on TV as long as it's safe. Lastly, Jerry Falwell Jr. He's the president of Liberty university. He tweeted a morally reprehensible photo of a mask with like, a black man kind of like mimicking slavery and stuff like that. Many black staff members at his university, they, they quit, they left the school. Two players, Key Latrell Clark and Tavion Land, they announced this past Monday, June 22nd, that they'll be going into the transfer portal. According to our homeboy at HBCU Game Day, and HBCU would definitely welcome these prospects with open arms. So my question is, as the conversation grows and more players are openly discussing playing football at HBCUs, we, do, we all know that, his, that, these, that these HBCUs have been historically underfunded and have had difficulty recruiting top tier athletes. Will that change? with the calls for racial justice? Um, only time would tell. Um, I think that's the main thing behind this. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing for players to unite and say, okay, let's take our talents to HBCU or let's consider going to HBCU. But also the funding, everything does play a part in it. Um, I was talking to – this was a while back. I can't remember who it was, but I was talking to somebody and we have to realize that some of these players and people, they have, they come from high schools or places where they have these top tier facilities um, and everything. And then they go to a place like HBCU or it doesn't even have to be HBCU, but any HBCU or a type of school and they're, their things are not up to date or up to par versus what they had in high school. So the reason I say all the time with tells because of course with funding that always takes time. Um, but also when you start implementing everything, um, getting those resources, getting those facilities, getting everything that players need to be successful on the field, um, time will tell and that can definitely help. HBCUs for a greater length of time, definitely compared to now. Yeah, I definitely agree. I feel like once the like playing field gets, you know, leveled out and even, then people will be considering HBCUs more and just giving them more respect, you know, period. And not even just be not even just because it's a black college, but just because, you know, the quality of football is low, you know, because of all these factors. You know, it's not even like predominantly white D2 colleges or some D1 colleges, like they just don't have the respect because they just don't have that quality of play. Once we start getting those, um, you know, D1 talent, um, you know, considering HBCUs and, you know, getting those 
good wins on national TV, getting those upsets, like then dudes will be like, oh, hey, you know what? I could, you know, play for a black coach, play for a black offensive coordinator, because that's big for them too. Like they might be playing for like one of the best coaches, but they can't relate to him on a personal level. You know what I mean? As they can relate to somebody who has the same culture and background as them as well. So if they can get, you know, national coverage and, you know, get a cool coach that they can relate to, like, that would definitely boost things for you. And I think, you know, not just players, but coaches have to go back. Um, these, our black coaches have to go back and coach at HBCUs and the personnel. Like, they have to, you know, put that talent, their talent to HBCUs. It can't just be the athletes. We got to look at, you know, these offensive coordinators. And it's hard because, you know, you're giving up a, a fat check. You know, if you offensive coordinator at a white school versus a head coach at an HBCU, you're going to be getting way more money. So I, it's tough, you know, but we just have to start thinking that. There, there are literally, and yeah, there are literally some offensive defensive coordinators who make 900 k plus or close to a million mm. and you talk about that decrease like you're almost talking about you're talking about a lot of hundred thousands and decrease so <laughs> um you know money talks whether we like it or not so but those factor differently for different people but money does talk so and i think also one of the awesome things is you, when you do or when the HBCU does attract like a major uh, recruit, I know everyone talks about, everyone throws out Zion Williamson as the star example of, of this argument. But I'll take a look at Southern University. I'll look at FAMU. I'll look at um, an A&T, places where you kind of are in a mid-market, not a big city, but a mid-sized city. And let's say one of those schools gets like, you know, a top tier foot or top tier recruit with the way that now these athletes can make money off of their image and their, and they can sign their image rights and all those different kinds of things. This is something where now you have the nurturing environment that everyone has been talking about where like, a Clemson or a Bama or FSU or Miami, people are so worried that they're just going to chew them up and spit them out. But at an HBCU, you have that nurture family environment where, yeah, they'll prepare you for life and they'll pre prepare you for the field and stepping in between those white lines. But they'll also turn around and show you the ropes. Like this is how you can set yourself up for, you know, your uh your your future and have the relationships to where you want to get in the NBA or get in the NFL they have that because technology's there like all the games are live streamed so like there's no excuse you're good the scouts are going to find you so and on that note that's all we got for this week thanks for tuning in everybody um get in the comments let us know what you think Please get in the comments, like, subscribe, hit the follow button, hit the notification bell on YouTube. You know what I'm saying? If you're watching us on Facebook, get in the comments. Same thing, you know. Let us know what you think. Um, the pandemic's kicking back up. So one of these days, we're going to all be in the same room doing this live on Facebook and YouTube. So you know i mean i'm hoping that we can get this done but with the pandemic going on i'm i'm we chilling <laughs> oh, oh. we chilling so um on that note guys we'll see y'all later <laughs>